We're back at HRN HQ at DeRosa with Sarah Albadwi. Had a couple separate videos, done videos with other people. But Keeneland is opening and we're together again. Together at HRN HQ once again. Indeed. So. And hopefully together at Keeneland this coming weekend. And in four weeks for the Breeders' Cup World Championships, the topic of today's conversation. Now, we still have plenty of win in your in events, uh, mostly this weekend. I'm not sure if there's any the next weekend, but there is a great a one few. with the Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that two year old juvenile turf race, but a lot of heavy lifting still to be done this week for most of the Breeders' Cup races. But one race where the preps are in the books is the big one, the Breeders' Cup Classic. Several of the contenders had their preps, what seems like months ago. Flightline, the very likely favorite. But others had their final preps this weekend, including who may have been the second choice, but a lot of chatter that life is good just didn't do enough in the Woodward. And I have him all the way down to the fourth choice on my fair odds line. Well, I don't know that he's going to end up being the fourth choice, but I think that that performance definitely stands in a lot of people's minds that he may not be the second choice. That's <laughs> for sure. Because not only did he kind of underperform from what we've seen from him so far this year, we also have the question of him being able to get that mile and a quarter distance still. We also have the question of how the pace is going to develop because he's fast early. So is Flightline. Flightline, at least we know that he can rate. He wouldn't and have can finish. To, and he wouldn't have to. I don't think if they chose to go on with it because I think that he could be faster early than life is good if that's the route that they wanted to take. But I think that it might be in their best interest to end up rating off of life is good who could honestly just stop. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to decide when and where they push the button. Keeneland's mile and a quarter configuration. It's a mile and an eighth oval, excuse me, a mile and a 16th oval. So it's not that shoot like you see at Churchill or Delmar, a little shorter run into the first turn, but Overall, I mean, I agree with you. If they just wanted to go to the lead and try to American Pharaoh the classic as he did in 2015, they could. Mm -hmm. uh, but they will have a target with Life is Good. I definitely don't think they'll wait till they turn for home to get a response because they are not going to risk, even from what we've seen as Life is Good, going to risk let him running away from them. But I, I just don't see after that Woodward – life is good's path to victory in the classic. I don't either. And I think that, you know, Todd Fletcher talked a little bit after the race about him having to rate off of another horse, which isn't something we've really seen him do in his career so far. I know that he and Jackie's were kind of battled the whole way around the track when he came back um, for that effort at Saratoga, but ended up not winning that race either. No. So does he get pressed early from who? Does he have it all his own way? He certainly had it all his own way in the Woodward. And maybe if he didn't even really handle that off surface, it still was kind of a shock to see Law Professor get that close to him on the turn for home. And yeah, there, there was never any separation, I guess, no. is my concern. It just seems like a horse who's 1 to 20 in a grade one race, who's talked about as maybe a threat to flight line at some point should have looked like, okay, he's got it in the bag. It's over. Not necessarily saying we needed to see a Met Mile or Pacific Classic type effort, but he just never, in my mind, put away Law Professor in earnest. And he didn't use his speed early. And I think that's what we're kind of talking about. If that is his weapon, and that's the thing that he is so good about him, that he can have that tremendous gate speed, and we see him in front so quickly of these other horses, then why are we throttling down and keeping him so close to the pack and giving those others the invitation to come and get him? And I think even too, when you did see him kick clear from Law Professor in the stretch, you still see him kind of wandering all over yeah. the place. And the wandering, although it may have been a little bit more intentional, was something that we did see in the Whitney too. And to me, that seems like a horse that He's going to get in trouble if he's facing better horses doing that later on. And he's going to get in trouble if he's getting tired late and he has to go further in the class. Yeah, the, the rub is, I mean, even taking flight line away, the three-year-olds, Taba, Epicenter, Rich Strike, they're all better than anyone else that was in the Woodward too. So it's not just, oh, what's he going to do against flight line? There's other dynamics in the race. The one thing I keep going back to, and I, I forget if I mentioned it with you or just talking about life is good in general, last year, and I fell for it, his Kelso was not great. He won, 
But I remember the very similar conversations. Oh, this isn't the life is good. We saw in the Jerkins, what's going on? And I bought the hype and I was dead against them in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. And then he fired what I thought was one of the best races by anyone all year. I don't know that we're in store for that. And certainly there's no one of Flightline's talent in last year's Dirt Mile versus this year's race that we're talking about. But that is one tiny factor I'm going back to. And Todd Pletcher is in the Hall of Fame in part for reasons like that. That's a fair point. We can't just say that last time in the Woodward is what we're going to see from Life is Good going forward. Because if he runs that race, we can kind of cross him off. But we have to remember what he's done so far in right. his career as well. It's not just that one-off race. Maybe it was the track. Maybe it's just a short field. They're not trying to crank him up all yeah, the way before. a true prep. A true <laughs> prep, indeed. Um, maybe they're trying to save something for the classic and not use all of the stops that they have available to them. I mean, who really knows? But at the same time, we still come back to those questions of, is he going to be able to get the distance? And what kind of pace dynamic is going to unfold with Flightline in the race? However, let's say we take Flightline out of the Breeders' Cup Classic as a contender. Who else would you expect to be in front other than life is good? Nobody. Yeah. Not Rich Strike. Most certainly not. <laughs> Although that would be quite a surprise. Yeah. Maybe even more of a surprise than the Kentucky Derby itself. That would be a huge surprise for sure. Uh, now, we have four weeks still to go over this. This betting coalesces and we know who the field is for real. But I did make a fair odds line looking ahead. And I was shocked. And, you know, the, the great thing about a fair odds line is it has to add up to 100. So you, you're confined. The numbers have to make sense. I have flight line at three to five, which is 62 and a half percent. I can understand if someone says, no, he's a more likely winner than that. I can understand maybe four to five or even money. I have him at three to five, though. And what that means is there are some pretty high odds on everyone else. Epicenter, Taba. Life is good. Olympiad is way up there. One of these horses is going to offer value, and it might actually be Flightline because if he's even money, but I can't see him being even money. If he's even money. But if he's three to five, then all these other horses have to be 15 to one. Right. And then it's like, who's going to be second? Right. Who's And who's going to take the money? Taba, Epicenter, they will take money, but enough – to make flight line interesting? Well, I think the Breeders' Cup betting is a different animal, no pun intended, than some of the other betting that we see throughout the year. This is something we saw in the Derby. We saw it again in the Preakness and the Belmont. Yeah. You have a lot more of the general public adding their money on names, you know, funny numbers, <laughs> random things, someone's birthday, you know, just kind of things that, you know, maybe even more successful than all the time and energy we spend on our analysis, which is <laughs> always fun to see but who knows what kind of horse they're going to gravitate to and why and maybe that does make flight line uh, a more reasonable price and worth betting a considerable amount of money on because i like you think that he's definitely the most likely winner of this race yeah and i i don't think others i can't imagine anyone out there actually think someone is more likely to win I could understand the case of, man, Epicenter should be 9-1. to one. He's 13-1. to one. I'm going to bet him. Like, I get that. But as of right now, it just seems like there's going to be some really big prices on very accomplished horses like Olympiad, for instance. Yeah. Uh, Country Grammar, I guess we've already seen what he can do against Flightline. But he did beat Life is Good, who is maybe everyone's alternative before this weekend. He ended up behind a stable mate defunded. Uh, Hot Rod Charlie went in the Lucas Classic over Rich Strike. Do either one of those two uh, prep races excite you for the Classic? Um, no. I mean, <laughs> I think that you kind of have to be a at least like a little bit disappointed by both of them, don't you? Because you saw all the horses come out of the Pacific Classic that then ran in the, what was it, Awesome Again? Right kind of merry-go-round race. They all yeah. just chased, defunded. Nobody really made up a ton of ground. Maybe it was a function of the way the track was playing that day, but that was kind of disappointing from some of them. And Absolutely. then obviously in the Lucas Classic, um, all the drama with the saddle or the elbowing or <laughs> the suspension and whatever way you want to see it. Um, I'm mostly just disappointed that Happy Saber kind of got boxed in and never really got Dang to make his clear run because I would have I would have Which maybe that make, win. Maybe that makes him the, I mean, of all the horses... They're all going to be overlooked. 
on the He's curve of flight line. But he is, I mean, he, yeah. to me, is, I'm drawing a blank on the, uh, it was a funny name that finished second to uh, American Pharaoh in the classic. I don't remember. It was something to do with, like, leaving your wife or something. Oh, well. You remember? It's in New York, well. Brad. <laughs> God, well, we'll look it up. We'll scroll. You'll scroll See, nobody even remembers it. because it was American Pharaoh. Right. Well, yeah. So. And this will be flight line. Yeah. But it was a very high priced exacta. So that's just to say maybe happy saver off that trip. Now, it's a hot button issue. Tell me and a lot that. of people are like, oh, this proves Ritz Strike. Like he's, and I never thought he was a fan horse anyway. Like the Travers was fine. Mm -hmm. But to me, I'd say it, the fact that him and Hot Rod Charlie were right there at the end, I kind of think we know what Hot Rod Charlie is. Like, neither of those horses showed that they're at Epicenter or Flight Lines level. No, definitely not. And I think this whole horse for course angle, I do believe in the ability of, or the existence of the horses for courses angle in certain circumstances. And I think that you do see certain horses run better at certain courses, but by running better, they also run faster. Um, and in terms of the figures, he did not run fastest at Churchill Downs. Right. His fastest figure is actually at Saratoga. So I think sometimes people get confused and they see that he finished second by a nose versus, you know, in a three-way photo for fourth. Um, in Saratoga and they're like, oh, well, he's a horse for course. He loves Churchill Downs. Okay. Well, that's not where his best numbers no. are. And one of the wins that everyone taught we had both his wins are at Churchill was in a maiden claimer. Right. I mean, what grade one winning so horse should, wouldn't have a have win? Right. Exactly. <laughs> we yeah. agree. We do. On that yeah. anyway. At least. So, so what do you think about the whole other hot button issue of that race? Oh, I mean, he recklessly. Yeah. Now, what I, I'm going to actually go back and wrap. Maybe you'll just stick it in here, but I actually did not notice the chicanery with Happy Saver that you mentioned. I didn't either because I was so focused on watching what actual incident happened with Hot Rod Charlie. Right. But I was watching it with one of my friends who is not in racing, and they were like, What about this one? And I was like, What do you mean? And he was like, No, rewind it. Like, show me the other horse. And I was like, Oh my God, you're right. Actually, he did kind of keep Happy Saber and you can kind of see it in the head on as well that there's a little bit of elbowing there and like a little bit of brushing too. So seeing that first and then what happened with Hot Rod Charlie only kind of tells me that this was a situation where he was aggressively riding all out to get this win. And look, I get it. You want redemption for this horse. You want to prove that he's not just this 80 to one winner of the Kentucky Derby. You want to prove that he's a good horse that can actually compete <laughs> with other grade one caliber horses, whether it's the other three-year-olds or older, but that's not the way to do it. And it takes away from the performances that we actually see from the horses. And also you're going to hurt somebody, whether it's the horse or another rider. And I think we just saw something like this with, um, uh, Christophe. Yeah, Sumian. Yes. In yeah. France. Yes. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, I mean, it's costing him business. He got the suspension post arc, which I know bothered some people, but the Aga Khan came out and said they're relieving him of uh, his duties as the first call rider. So, uh, you can't knock people off well, their horses. I mean, all this talk of, of safety and, and such, which is important, but I mean, the industry needs to show it's not just lip service when push comes to shove. And to me, right. there needs to be much more consistency overall with uh, regulations and actual um, repercussions for behavior like this. So yeah. that things actually change because otherwise, like you can keep getting away with it. What's it matter? Right. And unfortunately it is a business where the, most catastrophic incident could cause everyone to lose their jobs and life or your livelihood uh even worse so right yeah i mean that the, the margin for error there is you know a little less than in other types of sports uh for better or worse so that exactly. needs to be considered but well Four weeks to go. Four weeks to go. And we have something that people can order now. Oh, we'll also... they sure, we sure do. After they like and subscribe. Right. But once like that's done, you can then... get the Breeders' Cup Super yes. Screener, which will also have suggested wagers for all of the rest of the win in your in races, correct? Correct. Yeah. If you, if you buy now, it's the same price as it would be if you buy Breeders' Cup Week. Mm -hmm. But you get, more. you get it. And if you're not familiar with it, 
it's a good thing to get familiar with ahead of the big, big day. Sure. And if you are familiar with it, you probably have already subscribed because you know how great it is. Right. And not only is it picks, analysis, and um, suggested wagers, but it's also top you know, winners, top long shots, top value. And there's so many, um, it's really the suggested wagers at the bottom that are all summed up at like so neatly with exact (laughs) prices and different options, depending on your bankroll. And I think that that's a really unique feature that you don't see in a lot of other products that you can purchase. It's definitely geared toward how to bet the race efficiently versus here's who I think will win, or here's a long shot play. It's, It's about coalescing it into uh, actual wagering strategy and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some big hits and it doesn't force anything either. I I mean, if it's the type of race where there's just one logical horse to bet, that's the strategy. Right. And I I do appreciate that as well. It's not just trying to spin some sort of price horse out of nowhere. It's really focusing on what do we think is going to happen and here are the best races for those wagers. And it might not be every race. It might not, but It'll be some races, and for those, you'll definitely want to get the Super Screener. If you get it now, as Sarah said, you get it through Breeders' Cup and a huge weekend on tap. You and I are going to be discussing Keeneland. Yes. I know you have a special guest for Aqueduct. Yes, so the back. Is that confirmed, or are we just going to let it linger? We'll, we'll let it linger as a okay. surprise until we have an exact date planned. <laughs> Love it. And, uh, of course, uh, I will be dishing with the Paddock Prince himself on Keeneland as well later this week. So plenty of great content and harness land is back. Bulldog Hanover. Bulldog Hanover. So uh, lots of great horses racing in Lexington this weekend, multi-breed action. Horse Racing Nation has it all covered. Thanks for joining us. Like, and subscribe.